Welcome to my presentation on Mandoc. The topic this year is becoming the main BSD manual toolbox. My name is Ingo Schwarze, Schwarze at OpenBSD.org, and I have been an OpenBSD developer for the last six years. And while I have also contributed in a few other areas, it happened that my main focus became documentation tools. Uh, one thing that's always nice for starting a talk is reminding everybody that we are usually standing on the shoulders of giants and the pioneer in this area um, is really Cynthia Livingstone. You are seeing here on this picture. She designed the main documentation language we are still using today in 1989-1990, the MDoc language. She implemented that language herself. She translated the whole corpus of BSD manuals from the old MAN language to the new MDoc language. And in the process, she also re rewrote all the text that was still encumbered by AT&T copyrights. So all that done by, by one single person. Uh, when I talked here about Mandoc four years ago, when I first presented the Mandoc toolbox, my focus was this is a completely new tool and we have to train it to do real work. And you see how the beast has matured until now. Okay, so... Um, the key point, we, we are talking about documentation tools. The, the key point from my point of view about system documentation is really that all documentation should be in one place and in one format. So not have a part on the web and a part in HTML and a part in user share docs and whatnot. One place, one format. That makes it easy to find, easy to read, and easy to write. And only if it's easy to write there is any chance that it will be correct, complete, and concise. That, of course, puts a particular focus on which system to use if you want to use one system. The basic markup syntax we are still using today goes back more than 50 years. Uh, Jerry Salzer started the ROF runoff markup in 1964. It is unobtrusive, it's diff-friendly, it's easy to hand-edit, and there are simple tools to produce high-quality output in various formats from them. The basic manual structure goes back to the very first version of Unix, to Thompson and Ritchie. Um, the manual language still used in Linux today comes from the famous version 7 Unix, the last reserved Unix version that is publicly available. But the real revolution in documentation languages really was the invention of semantic markup of the MDoc language in 89-90 by Cynthia Livingston, which then got to the world with 4.4 BSD. At about the same time, James Clark wrote the GNU implementation of Trough, which, even though it's GPL software, dominated the toolbox world in the BSDs for more than two decades until finally Around 2010, we started to introduce the BSD-licensed Mandoc toolbox step-by-step step into the various BSDs. By now, practically all major BSDs use it. OpenBSD, FreeBSD, NetBSD, even Illumos has switched to it. Um, now, what is in that toolbox we are talking about? From the user perspective, it has become really simple. From the user perspective, you basically have one user land program that you are calling MAN, the manual viewer. That thing, when you call it once, does three things. It finds one manual page in the file system or using a database. You can decide which file to find either by giving its name or by giving a search query. Then in the second step, MAN will format the manual page, and in the third step, it will display it, usually using a pager. 
Even in this very elementary area, there's quite some progress since I presented here last year. Last year I said, man, the manual viewer is out of scope. That's not part of the toolbox. Now we have one unified interface for both for the viewer, for man, for the formatter, for mandoc, and for the search tool apropos. They all take the same options. And very new, this year, 2015, we have a unified and very much simplified configuration file format that I'll show. Um, the toolbox also contains a few auxiliary components. You have a database generation tool, you have a syntax checker, you have a pass tree debugger, you have a format converter from MAN to MDoc that is built in, uh, uh, pardon, from MDoc to MAN that is built in, and you have output front ends for various formats like HTML, PostScript, PDF. So before really starting with the individual topics, I give you a very brief overview which topics I'll talk about. I guess I never talked about so many different topics in a single public talk. It's just because so much happened in the last year. And I hope I won't get mired in, in that swamp of topics. The unified user interface, the new viewer and configuration file format is the first thing. The second is the same for the web. The third is improved formatting of mathematical equa equations. Then improved Unicode support, hunting bugs with a fuzzer program, um, detecting use of unsupported features, converting manual pages from another language, from the Perl documentation language to our common MDoc language. These are the main subjects, the main things that happened during this year. And I will wrap up providing a status and various operating systems and hinting at a few possible future directions. By the way, the pictures I'm using for, for illustrations are pictures taken by other people along the road of the um, bicycle tour I did uh, around southern Ontario just after last year's conference. Okay, so first thing we did, OpenBSD no longer uses the traditional BSD MAN program but an implementation integrated into MANDOC, into the formatter. The traditional setup was that MAN would fork and execute twice, once to call the formatter, and then again to page the output. Right now, the program finding the files in the file system and formatting is the same program. Um, now, which is the point in doing that? The point really is to have a unified interface for, for all the three main front ends, um, which means that when you call the viewer, when you type man some page, you can use command line options that were traditionally only available to the formatter, like saying how, which warning level you want to see or saying which output format you want. You can now do things like in OpenBSD, not yet in FreeBSD, that will only be available in FreeBSD 12. You can say things like man minus T HTML, just the name of the manual, and then pipe it directly to links or something. On the other way around, the search tool now has access to options that traditionally you only had in the viewer. The search tool, apropos, normally just lists um, a number of title lines from manuals. You now have options to say, I want to see the file names instead, or I want to see the command synopsis instead, or even I, I give it a search query, but I want to see all the full manual pages in one less right away. So that's quite flexible, and you don't need to remember different options for different programs. Besides, it, uh, it allows um, a simpler configuration file format. We tweaked a few minor things that I'm not going to name individually, except that one of them is quite nice. We have to maintain one less user land program. 
And the pr traditional BSD MAN is quite old code, so it's nice to not no longer need to maintain that. There are two other things that we can gain in the future that we have not yet exploited. Um, in particular, many, many library manuals document not only one, but two, three, 20 functions. And those typically have multiple entries in the file system, hard links. With the new database, we can get rid of all those hard links and can get rid of thousands of files in the, in the installation. And another nice thing that can be done with this, uh, it is already implemented. It's only not um, integrated yet in OpenBSD. We can have an interactive chooser. So you say, apropos something, it comes up with a list um, of programs that match, and then you can just choose one of them uh, to open the manual directly without exiting apropos first and typing a new command. <laughs> Another thing, yeah. Okay, any change of a program for a new program will come at a cost. In this case, the cost is that database lookup is slightly slower than file system lookup. Then again, on my notebook, the additional delay for displaying a manual page is on the order of 10 milliseconds. Um, there is another cost. When you install a new manual page on the system, and you want to find that new manual page with the search tools, you have to update the database. But the, at least the OpenBSD package tools run the required commands automatically for you, so you don't need to do it manually. And even if you forget it or it doesn't work, then the MAN tool itself will still work. You will still see the manuals when you explicitly call for them. You just won't find them in the search tool until the weekly make what is run. So there are very little downsides, if any, compared to the additional features we get. Oh, this is a nice one. The old configuration file format of the manual viewer. This is the list of all the features I identified in the old uh, the old configuration file format that are completely useless. I'm not going to bore you reading that list to you. I'll just pick out one. You can configure decompression filters, like if I have a gzip man page, I want to use gunzip on it. Well, the old configuration file format allowed you to configure different decompression filters in different sections of the manual. So uh, if I have a kernel manual that is gzipped, I want to use this decompression filter. If I have a userland manual, that's G I prefer the other decompression filter, and dozens of them. So the format was so complicated that really consistently everybody hated it, almost nobody used it, even though people had good uses for it. Some things you want to configure. So I came up with a new configuration file format that basically has just two directives, the things that people actually need. One is you can specify a man path. You give a directory name. It takes that directory as a complete tree of manual pages and consistently uses that tree across all the tools. And the other directive is specifying output options for example, for the terminal, saying how wide the terminal is. For HTML, saying which style sheet you want to link from the generated file. For PostScript or PDF, specifying the paper format, things like that. That's very easy to use and needs almost no learning. A few, a, a bit of the namespace in the new configuration file format has been reserved. So once people ask for it, I'm planning to implement the f following features, an alias directive, which makes it easier for people using languages like TCL or so to make whole trees more easily accessible with the minus S option. Then a sections directive that allows people to configure 
custom sections and to change the search order of sections and the filter directives in case any operating systems are using other compression formats besides gzip. However, so far nobody asked for these formats and as long as people don't need them, I say KISS, keep it stupidly simple. I, we, we shouldn't implement anything that people don't actually want. So be aware here I really reduced the functionality inside OpenBSD and people don't yell at me. So it's not always bad to make things simpler. Good. So far, I talked about viewing manual pages on the command line, on the terminal. Um, we also have a CGI for viewing them on the web, which has basically identical functionality. OpenBSD on the www.openbsd.org website no longer uses the traditional man CGI Perl script by Wolfram Schneider from FreeBSD, but a man CGI implementation included in the Mandoc toolkit. The traditional setup was that man CGI would fork and execute the, uh, the system's man command. That man command would fork and execute um, graph or later Mandoc but not in HTML mode, in terminal mode. Then the CGI the script in Perl with regular expressions, not even with a, with a library, would parse that terminal output, manually convert it to HTML, incredibly ugly. The new man CGI is one single C program. Y yes, uh, some people do write CGI programs in C. And it links in just the components needed the mandoc parses, the database client code, and the HTML formatter code, and directly generates clean HTML code with the benefit of providing full semantic search capabilities. So just at the command line, like at the command line in the web interface, you can use search for all the semantic gimmicks. Um, one thing that was surprising about this um, man CGI was that even though when I started at uh, last year's main hackathon in Ljubljana, all the underlying functionality was already quite mature and ready, there were, was about a dozen different components to, to tweak. So the configuration um, syntax for this thing had to be tweaked. So what I said is that there were, even in the, even though we had a good mature code base to, to really exchange the man CGI completely, a surprisingly large number of small things had to be fixed and adopted. So, so even in a seemingly small project, you can sometimes be prepared to to have to do a lot of work, but in the end it paid off because quite a few of the features we originally implemented for the web manual viewer um, turned out to be useful for the command line too. One of the um, new command line options derives from that. The code for that was originally developed for the web was then reused for the implementation of the man command I talked about before. Even the, the way the apropos command searches results was originally developed for the web viewer, so there were quite a few, uh, quite a few benefits. Uh, but one thing we completely overlooked at first is that even if you are not doing anything with HTTPS or authentication or limited access, whenever you do anything on the web, you at once get into security is issues simply because you are taking untrusted data off the net and you are processing it. The processing it itself could be harmful even if it only um, puts Lord on your server, 
And the output you throw at the user could be harmful to XSS or whatever. So at some point, we decided that uh, we had to audit the man CGI code for security issues. And the way we did that was in three ways. First, starting with all the untrusted input, tracing forward and looking, what is this input used for? On the other hand, starting from the other end, locating all the places where the CGI is printing output to the user and tracing backward. Where is that data coming from? Is it coming from trusted sources? Could it be clobbered some way? And given that there are two modules that need to be audited, the steering program and the formatter, um, we also identified all the places where data is transferred from one module to the other and started auditing from that interface into both directions. Of course, all these these tracings hopefully end up in the same code paths, but you really don't want to miss any code paths, so it's good to have a bit of redundancy in such an audit. Um, initially, almost all the security issues found were reported by Sébastien Marie, who, by the way, in the meantime, has become an OpenBSD developer, but I redid all the audit to make sure that nothing was missed, and I'm now reasonably confident that we found most things that shouldn't be in a program run on the web. So Baptiste uh, Daroussin is planning to replace the FreeBSD um, MAN CGI 2, and he's um, planning to use this exact code. Here are a few, uh, here is an overview of the security act, uh, issues we actually found. Um, one important class was unvalidated input. Um, unvalidated input in particular in the URI, both in the path provided to the URI, in the URI and in the query string. That re led to two kinds of problems. First, um, reading unrelated files from the file system on the server and possibly um, disclosing content of files that were never intended for display. And on the other hand, information disclosure in, in error messages. So even when the program realized, okay, this is strange, I shouldn't be doing that, then the error messages might reveal stuff to the, to the attacker he shouldn't know. Um, of course, the fixes were rejecting absolute paths, rejecting ascension to parent directories, um, validating stuff up front, paying attention what we displayed in error messages. And the other type of problems were mostly cross-site scripting issues, partly due to invalid characters embedded in query strings and partly due to um, stuff embedded in manual pages. I mean... When you run a manual page server, you will, FreeBSD, for example, also serves manual pages from ports. And you don't really know what people put into manual pages and ports, so that should not be able to trigger cross-site scripting attacks in your CGI front end. Uh, basically, all that, these CGI, uh, these XSS things require getting the encoding right, which turned out to be quite tricky because some of the output needs HTML encoding, some needs URI encoding, some even needs both. So it wasn't only a question of doing the encoding at the, at the right places, but doing the right number of encodings and choosing the right encoding at the right places. But I guess we figured it out at the end. Um, one thing that is almost impossible to fix is uh, regular expression DOS attacks. We prov at, on the command line, we allow people to search in manual pages using reg regular expressions, and we wanted to have the same functionality on the web, so people can enter regular expressions into that thing, and regular expressions are so powerful that you can't really 
prevent them from clobbering server resources. So the only mitigation we came up is just limiting the total time a CGI process can run. And so far, nobody has brought the, the server down. I hope it can stay like that. If, if it doesn't, we might have to switch off regular expressions. There's probably no better way. OK, so, so much about the various display tools. Yes, you're welcome. Thinking, going back to the regular expressions, is it PCRE, ERE, VRE? What's supported? Um, it's extended regular expressions by the standard routines contained in the C library. Could it not just be limited to VREs? Might be. I must admit I'm not really up to date whether those are less easy to exploit. Well, not impossible, but far, far harder. Far, far harder. That might make sense. On the other hand, um, getting on the nerves of people with restricting to BR. Yeah, but it might be better than switching. If really we suffer from attacks, then we should probably consider that. That's a nice, nice idea, yeah. OK, so, so far about um, the various viewers. Now let's get to some things about parsing and actual formatting. The main progress last year was made in the area of mathematical in equations in manual pages. Now I admit that the EQN language is not used as much as MDoc, MAN, and TBL, but there are some manual pages containing mathematical equations, in particular in XORG, and a bit in the math libraries. Um, the parsing works quite well. Christophs uh, firstly finished that in 2011, but the, um, the formatting was really ugly, and we had to apply some paint to that. In HTML output, Christophs rewrote the output module to generate math ML. Uh, in the context where he also switched the output to HTML5. That was actually quite straightforward. The parse streak falling out of his EQN parser can be translated one-to-one -to, -one to, to MathML. It's less than 200 lines of code, and the, the output looks quite beautiful in a graphical browser. Just look at that on the OpenBSD website in the open manuals. Look at a few um, X manuals containing matrices, and so it works quite well. Terminal output, at first sight, seems, seems harder. How do you format mathematical in equations on an ASCII terminal? Um, what GNU EQN does is they try to move elements up a line and down a line and try to draw lines from minus signs and such stuff, and the results are just unintelligible. It doesn't work at all. So I chose a different approach and rewrote the terminal output as a linear textual representation. And here you have a few examples of how fractions and matrices and functions look like. Admittedly, that's not pretty, but at least you can figure out what it means, and that is the main thing for manuals. So the status now is that Mandoc actually formats equations much better than GNU EQN, both on the terminal and for HTML, while PostScript and PDF is still the domain of, of the full thing of GNU EQN. Another thing about processing and formatting is uh, internationalized manuals, multi-byte characters. Now, admittedly, non-English manuals have a lot of problems. They are, they are rare. They are hard to maintain. Even if you try to maintain them, they tend to get outdated. And once they are outdated, they are arguably worse than nothing. However, it doesn't help at all if, in addition to all these problems, the tools hinder reading them. For that reason, Christophs quite early implemented basic UTF-8 support, but in the same way as it's done in Graph, it required a preprocessor to transform the UTF-8 input into Roth escape sequences, 
And then it required a specific output options to tell the thing, okay, I want UTF-8 output. So in addition to all those problems, you also had to, when, when actually viewing the manual pages, you had to take care of these special options. Now, this year, I integrated the preprocessor right into Mandoc so that the input encoding is automatically detected, and I switched the default out output mode from TASCII to TLocal, which means as long as you use... Uh, POSIX or C local, it doesn't make any difference for you. But if you have your stuff set up for UTF-8 output anyway, then it just works. So right now, viewing a Japanese or a Russian manual is no longer more difficult than viewing an English manual. And I think that is how it should be. Okay. So much for functionality. Now let's come to the things that don't work because probably all know programming is kind of about getting things wrong. This predator here found us a lot of bugs. A fuzzing tool is a program that runs another program trying to feed it varying input, trying to crash it or hang it. And the specific things advertised about the American Fuzzy Lob, Fuzzer program are that it does compile time instrumentation of the tested code and has genetic algorithms such that it can discover test cases itself and can execute as many functional code paths as possible with the goal of full functional coverage. Now, Getting full functional coverage for terminal output in Mandoc on modern PC hardware takes several days of round-the-clock running, but that is exactly what Jonathan Gray, an OpenBSD developer down in Australia, did repeatedly since end of last year. And I was a bit surprised that he found more than 40 issues grand, to grand total. Now, what were these? About a third of them were cases where we assumed that our data structures had certain invariants, and these were actually violated. There were cases of general um, envir environments very, uh, violated that way and cases of macro-specific ones. Another third were logic errors that were just arising from excessive complexity of the code in part unavailable because the language design is so complex. The, um, the topic here is badly nested block in the MDoc language. I talked about that four years ago. I can't repeat it for time constraints. Um, partly because of complexity in the implementation. The specific thing that caused these bugs was macro rewinding. So you open a block and then don't close it again or you close a block that is not even open, and all that has to be handled, and if you do it that in creative ways, then it might crash the program. So these were two-thirds, invariance and complexity. The remaining third were the things you expect to cause security issues, like missing input validation, buffer overflows, use after free. Um, so... It's not only interesting to look at the causes of bugs, but also the severity of the issues. I have to ask, and I know I'm being a smart ass, I'm sorry, but isn't one of the OpenBSD projects, isn't one of the things that you're supposed to do is not write your own string parsers? <sighs> <laughs> write your own string parsers. Well, it's... I don't know. I mean, it's... I've heard year after year about, oh, everybody out there, you know, oh, they wrote their own string handling routines, and that was the source of all their problems. As soon as we adopted OpenBSD's LibC, the problems went away. Is it, in fact, necessary to well, string handling? Well, the, the routines available in the, in the OpenBSD LibC are mostly 
routines for concatenating and copying strings like strill cut and strill copy, but I, I'm not aware of any OpenBSD specific string parsing routines. Okay. So uh, that not, I don't know what piece of code it was. So I'm just <laughs> yeah, but but you are right that the it's top the top five issues found were really buffer overruns where a string parser um, uh, parsed the string that was broken in such a creative way that it skipped over the final zero. And then if you, if you return that parser to the calling code and that calling code might modify the buffer, it can even end up as a write buffer overrun. Okay, so kind of... Um, one lesson learned here is that, I mean, this code was written by moderately experienced people in the context of OpenBSD, so you should assume they were aware that there are dangers, and still these things were in there. Um, and what is particularly interesting is that this... Wait, I'm just losing power... A uh, particular interesting thing was that uh, the easier the stuff would have been to avoid, the more dire the consequences. So if you just, if you pay attention from the beginning and then after a certain time audit the code once again, looking for the simplest thing, like being careful when passing back, when passing around pass pointers, making sure you don't pass zeros, watching out for use after free, not forgetting to validate input, being careful with arithmetic operations, uh, you will probably still find stuff and uh, find things to fix. Um, some of the... Conc Keep in mind all this in code written with security in mind f from the first point. It can't be stressed enough that some of the well-known things come up again and again. The largest numbers of bugs in absolute numbers were in the most complex code. So, yes, it does pay off to avoid complexity if you can. The distribution of the bugs across the various modules uh, was more or less proportional to the size of the modules. Not, not a big surprise, but yes, it does pay off to keep code small. Um, so in this case, we were about 1.5 serious bugs per thousand lines of code, something between half and three serious bugs per line of code is a range that you might expect. In this case, we had a few aggravating factors in particular, the languages we are parsing have no formal definitions. There's nothing has really ever been written down clearly, cleanly. They are not designed according to any strict paradigms, but rather evolved historically. So the parser requirements and the design goals weren't known from the start, but discovered piecemeal. So again and again, we had to break existing logic to change existing lo logic and existing invariants that might have contributed to, to, to this thing. Um, one thing that would have helped tremendously, I didn't find the time yet, but if you are working on a, an important project and uh, have the time to spend the effort, I would rec recommend to explicitly specify for all your mayor da data structures which invariants you intend to guarantee, and then audit your code whether all places changing these data structures actually respect the invariants, and uh, audit your code whether all places reading from the data structures don't assume anything else except those ex uh, invariants you have explicitly specified. In the case of Mandoc, that would have caught about a third of all those issues, which is quite a substantial fraction. Okay. So, well, broken stuff. Not only code is broken, manuals are broken too. Now, what do we do about it? Well, we tell the authors, we tell the porters. 
For that, we have three message levels in Mandoc. The lowest one is warnings. A warning means the author should be aware that the quality of his code could be improved. It's still clear what he means, but it might cause portability problems with older tools or whatever. An error means the author has written something, but we don't really know what that means. It's inconsistent. It's, it's likely that information gets lost. The, the user doesn't see the full text he's intended to see, or the, the, the formatting might be completely clobbered. That's an error. This year, I introduced a third level, which is called unsupported. That's not so much for manual authors, but for porters. It tells that Mandoc has the impression, okay, this is probably valid code, but I know I can't handle that yet. So better use Groff for formatting this particular manual. Um, there was historically a fourth level, and I'm quite proud of finally, after five years, having gotten rid of it. It was called fatal. That means you threw a manual at Mandoc, and it replied, no. <laughs> That's so weird, I don't give you any output. Well, there is some text in it, so it should display that text. And we have finally reached that whatever you throw at Mandoc, you get some output, even if it's empty. It, it no longer um, does nothing. Good. So in the base system, the problem is not the problem of broken manual pages is not really hard. If you find a, a broken manual in the base system, you fix it and are done with it. But in ports, that's not really an option. You can try sending patches upstream, but not likely that something will happen. So good news is that by now, after several years of development of Mandoc, about 95% of ports manuals just work. But what about the remaining 5%? In OpenBSD, we, ma we mark those ports where the manuals don't work with Mandoc with a use graph variable in the make file, and there are still about 200 such ports. These manuals are pre-formatted at port build time, and the, the formatted versions are packaged. <laughs> the advantage, obviously, is that end users get perfect manuals for every port. But, well, from a formatting perspective, the content might still be off. Um, the inconvenience is that you need um, support in the ports infrastructure for such a thing. Mark Espy has written that years ago, and it works. And the porters need to maintain this use graph variable for every single port. For that reason, to avoid this work, FreeBSD has chosen a different way. What they do is the MAN program doesn't run Mandoc right away, but first asks Mandoc, what do you think about this manual page? Can you deal with that? And then if Mandoc says, yeah, it looks good, it's run again, that time for real. And if Mandoc says, no, I don't think, I don't like that, then Groff is run instead. Inconvenience are considerable, of course, because at the time you run the man command, the page has to be parsed twice. That costs time. And particularly bad in case Mandoc doesn't realize it's unfit for the job. It's too confident. The user gets incompleted or misformatted output. And on the other hand, if Mandoc is shy and says, no, I don't want that, even though it could handle it, then time is wasted on running graph. So yeah, it's kind of a trade-off in which way you do it. NetBSD has a very creative way to handle that. If I understand correctly, they, they just ignore the whole problem, and it seems to be good enough for them. I don't hear complaints about those probably about 5% of broken ports manuals in, in NetBSD. Well, in the future, uh, we might improve it in two ways. One way would be to improve low-level ROF support in Mandoc and to remove use graph from various OpenBSD ports. Another way would be to improve the W unsupported logic 
such that the number of problems in FreeBSD is reduced. And at least Nadi, so Christian Weisgerber, a colleague in OpenBSD, myself, hope that these two ways will ultimately converge so that we can go the NetBSD way and everything just works with Mandoc. But we'll still take some time. Okay. At this point, I'm through with the Mandoc toolbox in the strict sense. Now I'm talking about one of the companion tools, a converter from the Perlpot format to the MDoc format, because in that area we have made quite some progress during the last few months. Why is Perlpot relevant? Well, after the MDoc format used in BSDs and the MAN format used in Linux, I guess that's the third most used format for, um, for, for manuals. It is used by Perl, it is used by OpenSSL, it is used by FFmpeg, by various projects. Um, usually these pages are converted to the old man format by the pot to man program, which is itself written in Perl. The downsides are that you get no semantic searching and that the developers have to learn another formatting language, the Perlpot language, which is less powerful. So learning two languages and one is even less powerful than the other doesn't make a lot of sense. So we have decided to convert the LibreSSL manuals from um, Perlpot to MDoc. Anthony Bentley has done half that work already last year and it is committed, so the libssl manuals are done. I'm currently working on the libcrypto manuals together with a guy from Düsseldorf, Max Fillinger. Um, for Anthony, it was still quite hard because he only had a, a um, a prototype of the pot to mdoc tool and it required a lot of manual post-processing. I've now improved a lot of details, in particular in things like white space and closing punctuation and quoting. You might say, well, that all seems quite minor, but you need to keep in mind that the goal is to commit the converted manuals so the generated code must be clean and maintainable because after that developers are going to hand edit it for decades maybe. So and cleaning it up by hand is quite tedious. We are talking about hundreds of manuals here. But admittedly, uh, when talking about improvements of this pot to mdoc converter, the conceptual things are even more interesting Keep in mind that the Perl pod format has no semantic markup. It basically only says things about the physical formatting, bold and italic and so on. But in the output, in the mdoc output, you want semantic markup. And I've written some um, heuristics that look at really at the text where there are parentheses and commas and blanks and figure out, oh, this might be a function declaration, in particular when it's in the synopsis, and add the missing markup on the fly for function types and uh, function names and function arguments and so on. And not only that, but it also uses hash tables using the OHash library written by Mark SP and remembers the names such that when later in the description these function names and argument names reoccur, they can be found in the hash tables and the correct macros can be inserted in the text, which considerably reduces the amount of manual post-processing that needs to be done. Um, I released all that last month, so it's quite new. One thing that is interesting about this, this is that it is somewhat similar to stuff Eric Raymond has done in the context of, um, of the tool he's using for converting MAN manuals to DocBook. 
how is it called, that thing? I've forgotten the name, but, uh, yeah. Um, so, a dream for the future is that we might use similar logic like the one developed here in the future to extract semantic information from man manuals and enable the semantic searching that we have for MDoc documents for MAN2, but there is no clear concept yet how to do that. It's just an observation that the, the, the algorithms needed for ins extracting these information from various formats, be it ProPod or MAN or whatever, are quite similar. Good. So let's get to the status. In OpenBSD, most of the work was already done last year, so there is a lot that was complete by 2014. In particular, Mandoc is the only documentation formatter in OpenBSD base now for all, almost five years, and the search tools had, have been switched before last year's conference. The main progress here since last year is the new online interface, the unified interface for the formatter and search tools, the switch of the manual viewer to the new implementation, and all that is released last month with OpenBSD 5.7. So even if you install OpenBSD stable now, you get all that. Part of that will only be available in the next, no, not in the next, but in the re uh, FreeBSD release after that, FreeBSD 12. But FreeBSD has made even more progress than OpenBSD this year. Last year, I could only say, okay, they have it in base, but don't use it. Right now, Baptiste Daroussin has done tremendous work. He has switched the default formatter end of last year. He's using the unsupported option I explained for ports manuals since March this year. He has switched the search tools a week ago um, the code in FreeBSD is completely up to date with the latest stable Mandoc release. All that is going to be released with FreeBSD 11, and the only thing he postpones until FreeBSD 12 is switching the MAN implementation because he's sensible enough to say we shouldn't change everything at the same time that might alienate users People might get upset if everything changes at the same time, but very impressive progress here in FreeBSD. Unfortunately, in NetBSD and Dragonfly, almost nothing happened. NetBSD is using Mandoc as the default formatter longer than FreeBSD, uh, but they don't have semantic search tools. They have their own search implementation, which is doing full text search, but lacking semantic search. And Dragonfly is still having it, but not using it. Another system that made impressive progress is Illumos. In previous years, we often said, we often cited uh, Solaris-based systems as examples of very old, very traditional stuff that didn't even have any MDoc implementation. Illumos has decided to bit by bit translate all their manuals from MAN to MDoc. So the same thing Cynthia Livingston in BSD did in 1990. They are now doing that too. I, it will be interesting to see whether they complete it in one year like she did. Uh, I guess not. But um, Gareth Amor um, switched the default formatter in the same commit as he imported Mandoc into the base system. So now they have Mandoc and they are using it. Not the newest version, but it seems to just work for them. That's the third system grand total who did the, the switch and the first non-BSD system. In Linux, uh, there are Surprisingly, there are two distributions who are completely relying on Mandoc. Both are very small ones, Alpine Linux and Void Linux, but they have everything. They have the search tools, they use the, the manual viewer, they have the latest release. 
Um, Alpine Linux was the first non-BSD system ever to use the, the Mandoc-based MAN. Um, there are a few others. Arch Linux has an official port. Slackware and Crooks have unofficial one, but no, none of the Mayo Linuxes really has picked up anything so far, even though ports have been available for all of them unofficially, and I'm regularly testing on Debian before releases. We shall see what happens there, yeah? Okay. It, it would be nice. It would somehow fit the the Arch Linux philosophy more or less. Well, let's just be patient. And if anybody, if if they need help, they should just come to us, to Chris Dubs and myself, and we'll try to help them if they need any help. Other operating systems, Minix has it in base, but is somehow completely apathetic since five years or something. Uh, there is a, some kind of a user community or several user communities in OS X. There are ports available both on Homebrew and Mac ports. There is even a halfway up-to-date port for, for Windows. Uh, such information is periodically updated on our website, so you can see the status also between conferences. So the status summary is fully integrated in OpenBSD, Alpine Linux, Void Linux, except for MAN, also in FreeBSD current. The default formatter in NetBSD and Illumos, it's at least in the base system in FreeBSD 10, Dragonfly and Minix. Official packages exist for FreeBSD 9, Arch Linux, and PKG source. And then there are a few having unofficial packages or outdated packages. I'm regularly announcing goals for the future at conferences. Of those that were announced, four were reached this year. The replacement of the MAN CGI, the integration of preconf, the switch to local output by default and replacing MAN in OpenBSD. Several things are in progress. We are working on the libcrypto manuals in LibreSSL and improving pod to mdoc to facilitate that. We are, I'm unifying the parsers, aiming for better ROF support in the future. That's a very complicated subject that I really couldn't cover in this talk, if I were to talk about that, I would have to give a full talk maybe sometime later. Um, the unsupported mode is still being improved. We want to, at some point, delete all those redundant hard links in the file system. Um, a thing FreeBSD already does. One thing FreeBSD already did a month ago but I only learned about it yesterday, so it's not in the slides yet, is that Tech Info is no longer in FreeBSD. Baptiste Roussin used the Tech Info to MDoc utility by Chris Dubs to convert all the Tech Info documentation to MDoc. I'd like to do that in OpenBSD too. This is a very nice example of FreeBSD leading the way, actually. What's a bit stalled is providing help with the MAN to MDoc conversions, but that can be picked up again. It's basically what Christops has started with the DocBook to MDoc tool. Let's mention two things that have not yet been started. At some point I dream of using pod to MDoc, but not for conversions with manual post-processing, but inside the build system, instead of running pod to MAN on the Perl manuals, we could run pod to mdoc, convert all the Perl manuals to mdoc format, and then we would get semantic searching in Perl manuals in the OpenBSD base system for free. And another thing, one thing that is good about info, not talking about all the problems that info has, but one thing that is good there is internal linking within manual pages. 
So long as we don't change the basic way manual pages are built, self-contained, linear, easy to navigate by hand, if we get additional options for linking inside manual pages, that would help a bit. And one idea to do that was functionality similar to C tags that could be integrated into less. But that really needs to be worked out. To conclude, I'd like to, to thank a few people. Chris Dubs, of course, the original author of Mandoc, who again contributed quite some code this year. For example, the new UN parser, HTML5 and MathML output. Then, of course, Jonathan Gray, who did extensive testing with AFL, reporting more than 40 important bugs. Baptiste Roussin for tremendous work on FreeBSD system integration and also sending source code patches. Christian Weisgerber, Nadi at OpenBSD for removing UseGraph from many ports and helping with OpenBSD porting work. Thomas Klausner, Wiz at NetBSD for PKG source maintenance. Um, while NetBSD is lagging a bit in the base system, Thomas is doing excellent work on PKG source. Nathanael Kopa, Alpine Linux, who did system integration there and proved that Mandoc can be used as the system manual formatter on Linux. Paul Onishuk, also Alpine Linux, suggested the implementation of MAN. If it weren't for Paul who said, oh, why don't you implement MAN? And I said, well, that's a bad idea. Last year at BSD can I said that's out of scope. But then I stepped back and thought, well, actually, why not? We already have almost all the code that is needed. It just needs to be shuffled a bit. This year, there were quite a few people who contributed patches. And of course, again, even more people who reported bugs or suggested features. 